Hi, this is Don Cusick with The Music Biz, and today my guest is Niles Borup. Niles is a gospel songwriter, wrote the Dove Award-winning Via Dolorosa, Sandy Patty recorded that one Dove for Song of the Year in 1986, uh, as well as a number of other songs. I think you told me 78 different songs you had recorded last year, That's including, great. well, you've had cuts by people like Denise Williams, Debbie Boone, Steve Green, Rick Kua, Mighty Clouds of Joy, Rex and Elon Singers. Uh, we'll cut the list off now, but it goes on and on. Uh, first, tell me, how did you know? Where are you from, and, and how did you get to Nashville? Well, I'm originally from South Carolina, Aiken, South Carolina. And how did I get to Nashville? In a nutshell, I uh, wrote my first song when I was 14, and from that point was bitten by the bug and felt really called to write songs. And uh, always wanted to. So I went to college at Mercer University and did real well. And when I got through college, I had a degree in drama and uh, kind of tried to figure out what I was going to do with that. So I said, I know what I'll do with that. I'll go to seminary. Now that didn't make much sense, but that's what I did. And I chose to go to Vanderbilt Divinity School because it was in Nashville. And in the back of my mind, I said, I don't know how in the world I'm going to ever be a songwriter, but I'm going to give it a shot while I'm, I have three years there to go to school and then in my spare time, see if I can uh, make some headway as a songwriter. So I went to the Divinity School at Vanderbilt and uh, during my spare time every afternoon, I plugged songs on Music Row trying to get somebody interested. And uh, as fate would have it, uh, two days after I graduated seminary, I signed my first exclusive agreement with A. Cuff Rose in country music at that mm -hmm. time. What was the first song you, you wrote? Uh, oh my goodness. Um, if it had a title, I wouldn't really be able to remember. It went uh, as bad as it is, 14, remember. Let's see, I thought I found the girl I was looking for, so I told everyone around that I love you and you love me, and I knew it was for good. See, there's a lot of hope for a lot of people out there. <laughs> How about the first song you had recorded? First song I had recorded was a song called Wake the Town by Andres Blackwood and Company that I co-wrote with David Baroni. And uh, I'm real proud of that particular mm -hmm. cut. And uh, matter of fact, that cut is what got me into gospel music. David uh, Baroni and I started writing when I was writing country music at Acuff Rose, and my heart just wasn't in country music. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I wrote from my head and not from my experience. And uh, so when David and I started writing together, uh, while I was at A. Cuff Rose, we started writing gospel, and it just flowed so easily that I decided mm -hmm. that uh, this is where I need to be, and uh, the Lord has honored that. Well, when did you start feeling like a songwriter? That's a real good question. I think when I started getting my first uh, draw, my mm -hmm. first advances against future royalty, a, a steady weekly draw, uh, after a few weeks of that and working all during the week trying to come up with songs, mm -hmm. I began to feel comfortable saying I'm a songwriter and I could... Um, I had a real interesting experience. Uh, I went into the hospital and had... Um, uh, was put under and it has a truth serum effect. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was pastoring a church at that time and I'm an ordained minister. And uh, the nurse asked me, what, do I, what did I do just to check and see if the medicine had taken effect? And I said I was a songwriter. And that, when I woke up, she said, I didn't know you were a songwriter. I thought you were a minister. And that always, always affected me, that I, that I guess deep down mm. in my unconscious, I had recognized that, yeah, mm. I guess I'm a songwriter. How did you get signed to, to Acuff Rose? Oh, it's a, it's a long story, uh, but I'll, I'll try to make it short. I was uh, writing with a young man by the name of Mark Sanders at that time. And we were just writing every day after I got out of class and uh, running around town pitching to ATV and MCA and Tree and a, uh, at that point April Blackwood, which is now CBS mm -hmm. Songs, and just anywhere we could get in the door. And Acuff Rose was one of those. And uh, one day, um, uh, Ronnie Gant, who was the professional manager there, I think still is, uh, 
said he liked what he was hearing and asked us to bring some more songs in the next week. So we said, sure. So we went back to our catalog, brought in a couple more songs. Next week he uh, said, uh, yeah, I like what I'm hearing. I'll hold these. Is that all right? And I said, yeah, yeah. So, so he said, I want you to bring me about three more next week. Can you do that? Oh, well, uh, so, and he did this for eight weeks. And after about the third week, we didn't have any more songs. So we were writing like crazy mm -hmm. trying to bring him songs. And, uh, and after about the eighth week, he, uh, he asked us to sign. And uh, I, I learned a valuable lesson in that, in that uh, he was testing to see if we would be able to consistently come up with material that he felt like he could use. And I think that was very wise. How did you begin getting in the doors uh, as a songwriter? Uh, it's, it's tough. I think the key is counting every little step as a victory. Uh, at first, just to even get the uh, receptionist to look up and acknowledge your existence was a major accomplishment. Mm -hmm. But where most people get frustrated at that, if I got the receptionist to give me the time of day, to treat me uh, mm -hmm. as if I wasn't a squirrel or a spook or, or, or some strange being, uh, I counted that as a huge victory and I got excited and I counted that as a victory. Even though all I got to do was either drop off a tape or even was, was totally rejected. Mm -hmm. And then as each step followed, which was just mostly being very consistent, um, being very polite, being very uh, cordial, being very friendly when they rejected you, taking that gracefully. Mm -hmm. uh, after a while they realized this guy's here and he's giving it a real shot. and. Uh, uh, he's not going to be a pain if we tell him no or we're busy. He's going to take that real nice and be mm -hmm. real friendly and he's not going to be discouraged. And after a while they began to, uh, I guess, either have pity or whatever <laughs> and, and began to open the doors very mm -hmm. slowly. I had a friend of mine, Stuart Harris, uh, who was from my hometown, who was writing with Jerry Reed Enterprises at that time, who um, would critique my songs for me and he was very helpful in helping me to grow as a writer when I first got to town so that uh, when I did pitch something it wasn't so bad that I closed the door. Mm -hmm. um, that's one of the things I think is a real key when they first do uh, see you if your material is something that shows promise then the doors are usually uh, not closed, they're not wide open, but they're not mm -hmm. closed. It depends on your attitude and your persistence and your your drive as to whether those doors continue to open or not. But if, uh, if your attitude's bad or if the songs are not there, uh, the doors will be locked shut mm -hmm. very quickly. You mentioned co-writing. Did you mm -hmm. co-write from the very beginning or did... No, I started co-writing. Um, I learned some valuable lessons. I had a few songs published by myself uh, and then, uh, but just really wasn't getting anywhere. Uh, in the industry. I had a little song that became a theme song for a national organization, which was nice, and, and I had a couple of octavos and, and, and print things, but nothing that was going to make me a living. And I went to the country music seminar that ASCAP had, oh, this was 79 or 80, one of the very first, one, the very first one they had. And uh, they were talking, a lot of the writers there were talking about co-writing. And then I had another friend of mine suggest that I really take a hard look at myself and uh, uh, tried to evaluate what my strengths and weaknesses were. So I did. And I realized what my strengths were and what my weaknesses were. And then I got with uh, and searched out a co-writer that had the just the opposite. And together we learned from each other so we grew to become more well-rounded writers. Uh, and yet we gave ourselves the balance that we needed and really to accomplish a lot. Plus I find myself, and I found a lot of writers this way, that once you have an appointment with somebody, or once you have a commitment to somebody to try to write, um, it's much easier to get up in the morning and go down there. Well, otherwise you'll go, well, Donahue has somebody interesting on this morning. I'll watch that. And, oh, I love Andy of Mayberry. And Gomer Pyle's good. You see, I've got the whole mm -hmm. morning lineup down. Mm -hmm. and, and the reason for that is, is because a lot of times if you don't co-write and you're going to say, well, I'll write by myself today. It's just, it's hard to get that motivation mm -hmm. going. But when you've got a commitment to be there with somebody, it's very easy to get up and go. And that's one reason I co-write so much. Okay, that's a big advantage. What's the disadvantage of co-writing? I think really the only disadvantage at all that I've been able to find, and I'm not really convinced that it's a major disadvantage, and that is financial. Mm -hmm. Obviously, you make more money if you write it on your own. 
However, my experience has been that I get far more activity when I co-write because then I have, not only do I go out and pitch and uh, other writers who I write with go out and pitch, but then my publisher pitches and their publisher pitches and all of us have different connections and different uh, ends that others don't have and when we pull that all together we have much more outlets. So in fact I get more activity, less income for each individual piece but more, act more uh, activity. Mm -hmm. So. Um, I think it comes out in the wash, but that would be a drawback, and that's one reason a lot of people don't co-write. But I think mm -hmm. that's, the, I think insecurity is another reason that a lot of people don't co-write. Uh, you've got to be very secure in yourself in the sense of being able to be vulnerable with another person mm -hmm. and throw out crazy ideas, hoping that they lead mm -hmm. to other ideas. And some people find that very difficult to do. How, how does co-writing work? I mean, do you come come into a, a with an idea for a song or somebody else come with an idea or you just come in cold both of you? Uh, very rarely do we come in cold. I know personally I keep an idea book and I know that, know that a lot of writers I've written with have started doing that. Mm -hmm. uh, they've seen how it works for me. And that is I just collect ideas all along. I mean we may be sitting here now and I may come up with an idea and then I'll run and put it down into my book. And that way I always have a resource of, of ideas to springboard off of. I've found if you come in cold, a lot of times you just sit there and stare at each other, or you talk about the weather, or you talk about what's going on in life or in the business. And uh, although that can be fun and, and helpful at times, uh, that's not the most productive use of your time. But having an idea to spring off mm -hmm. of, some kind of a hook or some kind of a concept that you can have a hook come out of, then uh, that's a good springboard into the, to writing the rest of the These song. hooks mostly lyrical? Mostly. Occasionally there's a strong musical hook that, mm -hmm. uh, that uh, lends itself to coming up with a, a lyrical hook very easily. Most, time, most of the time it is a lyrical hook though. So you, you basically start with the words. No, I wouldn't say that. I would say I'd start with a lyrical hook. Mm -hmm. um, then a lot of times, it, then it's just as every songwriter who'll, who you'll ever interview I'm sure will say is that unless they are a lyricist strictly or mm -hmm. a music writer strictly, uh, it can come any number of ways, any number of directions depending on the day. Maybe the, the mel melodic writer is, uh, or the person who's stronger musically may uh, be hot that day and come up and just knock out a melody. It may be mm -hmm. that I'm on a roll and I come up with a lyric very quickly. Maybe we come up with it as we go, mm -hmm. but it, it's just... Uh, what, what do you mostly write? Do you mostly write lyrics or do you mostly do music? Well, I'm, it's interesting. The industry always wants to pigeonhole you. Mm -hmm. and, and I think people have a natural tendency to want to do that so that they can identify you. Uh, no, I'm not a, a, a lyricist or, uh, and I'm not a melody writer, I'm a songwriter mm -hmm. and I, I uh, try very hard to continue to grow in every aspect of my writing. I'm probably stronger lyrically, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, no, I've been on parts of songs where I've only been on the music and uh, been mm -hmm. uh, well, more times the lyric. but. Uh, but most of the time, words and music by me and whoever I'm writing with. Yeah. What, uh, what tends to take the longest? Getting the lyrics right or getting the music right? Now, this is real debatable. Uh, my personal opinion is that lyrics take a lot longer, usually. Mm -hmm. And the, the hardest part of the, uh, the business, is, as far as songwriting goes, I think is lyric. Why? Well, I think, that, I think lyricists, if you're a great lyricist, you can last your lifetime because lyrics don't change a great deal. But melodic writers, it flows very easily and it comes very natural and they can knock out a melody in, in, in 15 minutes to an hour where it took the lyricist maybe a whole day or two days to come up with the lyric. Um, but on the other hand, I have found that unless a writer is very, very open and very, very willing to continue to work on their craft, that uh, their style falls out uh, in a few years and therefore melodic writers don't last. And therefore, maybe it does balance out because the, the melodic writer does um, have to play scales and mm -hmm. learn the piano and do all those kinds of things that uh, pay a lot of dues early on to get to, to where they're writing commercial material. You mentioned learning or working on your craft. How do you do that? Do you, do you read, watch movies, all, study songs? What? All, all those things, all those things. Uh, I drive my wife uh, nuts when we're driving in the car because uh, 
uh, whenever I'm listening to the radio, I'm listening and studying the song. And I'll make some kind of comment about how wonderful that is, or that could have been stronger, or I wonder if, if they'd have tried this, how that would have worked. And she's like, well, I'm trying to listen to the music. So, so it, music is not uh, quite the enjoyment that mm -hmm. it was for me. It, it's, it's like my work now. So whenever I'm listening, I'm always, I'm always studying. That's mm -hmm. one way. Also by reading, always being open to, uh, to uh, learning from co-writers. Co-writers are a main way I learn. I know it's been a joy for me to work with like Kirk Kaiser and different uh, writers that in Christian music, as young as our industry is, they're almost at that legendary status. Mm -hmm. And uh, to be able just to pick their brains out and to, uh, to understand where their minds are working is just a tremendous education. Hmm. How about, uh, what's been your influences? What's, who has influenced you or what has influenced you most? Uh, that's, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, if I had a major influence as a writer, it would be a very strange mixture. Uh, it would be Harry Chapin would be probably on the top of the list. Larry Norman would be uh, another person that has greatly affected me. And Phil Oakes, uh, who's an old folk writer, are, are all uh, great influences. Paul Simon, especially during the Simon and Garfunkel time, was, was somewhat of an influence. And uh, uh, just kind of an oddball ball collection there. Mm -hmm. uh, Gary Paxton uh, was somewhat of an influence as far as some of his early albums with story songs. I love story songs and I love image songs mm -hmm. and I love to try to come up uh, with images. I, I find that images grab people's attention. If you can paint a picture, they'll be into the story. Mm -hmm. And uh, so all of those people were great image creators and uh, and I think that's where my strength is is because I studied them so much of growing up. What do you write anything else other than songs? Uh no not not really. Um uh no not really. Mm -hmm. I I have heard that a lot of times a songwriter is a frustrated performer. They actually want to be a performer. Do you find that with a lot of writers? Have oh, you ever no, no doubt before? about it. No doubt. I'm I'm real fortunate because that's not the case with me. Mm -hmm. I I, when I was growing up, I did perform a lot, but I did that mostly out of necessity because mm -hmm. uh, the only way I was going to see if my songs worked were to be to try them out, and I couldn't get anybody else to try them out, so I did. Mm -hmm. And so I'd sing for an old folks group or a youth group or whatever I could get in front of, and uh, bless their hearts, they, they put up with it, and most of them did it very graciously. But uh, it's... Uh, a lot of people I co-write with, uh, they, they are really into wanting to be performers. When I got to Nashville, I, my head was cleared very quick from that. Mm -hmm. Any idea I had about me being a singer was quick to, quickly put to rest, because when you get there, you're with the best in the world. And uh, when I saw how I compared in that field, mm -hmm. it was like, no, writing's for me. That's where I want to be. And how about demos? Do you, do you sing your own demos? Oh, no. Oh, mm -hmm. no. I, and I have no, no, no desire. I'm one of those odd writers that... that uh, when I write a song, I like to hand it to my publisher and then have my hair head clear to, to write another song. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm, early on, when I, when I was learning mm -hmm. about the industry, I would always want to be at the demo session and it was such a thrill to, you know, to hear all the instruments and wow, this is my song. And, and, and I haven't lost that thrill, but, but I mean, I know what goes on in the studio now and I know a lot of the session players and, and, and that's not a. That's not where my interest is. It's not in production. It's mm -hmm. in writing. My joy comes in finishing a great song, and uh, so I want to stick with that and and not be in the studio. I trust the people that I work with enough to uh, to come up with a when a, with an adequate demo. Okay. So you've you, you you've written the song and you just what put it on cassette tape and give it to the uh, publisher. I give it to my publisher. And then they decide whether a demo is done or not, or, or they pretty much no, demo we, them all? Well, I mean, it, it, literally, it's, it's up to their discretion. However, mm -hmm. they certainly don't exclude me from that process. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I find that most of the stuff I write uh, gets demoed, and, mm -hmm. and it's not a problem. If I feel strongly about a song getting demoed, I don't have any doubt that mm -hmm. they would do that. Uh, on the other hand, uh, I try to be open to their opinions, and I find that most of the time mm -hmm. they're, they're pretty right. Who, who is your publisher now? Word Music. Okay. You spent some time with Acuff Rose, mm -hmm. and you left there after a while. After a year. After a year. 
Where did you go from there? Straight into Word. Oh, you went straight into Word from there? Didn't even miss a, 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 a weekly draw check. Oh. <laughs> okay. And, and you have stayed with Word since Been then? Been with Word now be six years in May. Mm -hmm. Is that a problem with co-writing that if you get with other uh, writers of other publishing companies? Uh, no. I have never found it to be a problem. Not at mm -hmm. all. As a matter of fact, uh, even encouraged. Mm -hmm. uh, in country music, I have I found that a, a huge problem. At Acuff Rose, they didn't want us to write outside the company. I know that Combine and other companies mm -hmm. have long had policies of no co-writing outside mm -hmm. the company. And uh, I'm sure they have their reasons, and I'm sure that uh, for whatever reasons they are, they're, they're valid. But uh, my experience has been that the gain of co-writing mm -hmm. far outweighs the having the exclusiveness of the copyright. Mm -hmm. Okay, how does a song get recorded? Okay, you've got it demoed, you've got it ready to roll. How, does, how do you get it recorded? Well, I mean, as facetious as this may sound, it's, it's any way I can get it recorded. Mm -hmm. uh, I know I really like to plug, and I know I like to get out and to um, work hard to get songs recorded. I, I go and see producers a lot. Whenever artists are in the office, I go and hunt them down and uh, pull them aside and talk to them about life for a few minutes and find out where their heads are at and then go and try to write for them and then bring them back something. It's, a, it's an ongoing uh, process. I find that most songs... Uh, do get recorded with some type of personal contact. That doesn't mean uh, that it's who you know all the time. Uh, I mean, I certainly didn't know Sandy Patty at all mm -hmm. when Via Dolorosa got recorded. However, um, and the fact that I know Sandy now didn't get me a song on her last album. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think that if they know who you are and they know the quality of what you write, then they'll listen to it. Mm -hmm. so that it's, it's who you know in the sense that then you get access to them truly putting on the tape, mm -hmm. listening to it, and giving it mm -hmm. uh, with an open mind consideration. Is this most of the artists or is this the producers doing this? Both. I think both. I think once you get to a certain level, uh, when a producer gets a tape that has your name on it, they'll listen to the song. Mm -hmm. And that's all you can ask. And then, then, then it's going to be the song. The song's mm -hmm. going to either be what, and it's not a matter of whether the song's the greatest song. I, I hear that, well, you know, only the best songs get on the record. I don't believe that. I believe it's the songs that the artist or the producer uh, or the record company or whatever the, the group is that are making this decision. It's what they want to say for that particular mm -hmm. album. I believe that's what it is. And if I can give them something in a musical style that fits that singer, uh, and it's something they want to say, then I think I've got a song recorded. But it's going to be the song anyway. Mm -hmm. They're not going to cut a song because of who I am. Uh, occasionally that'll, be ha that'll happen, but that'll usually be with a younger artist more than with mm -hmm. an established artist. They're going to pick a song because it's, a, it's, a, it's what they want to say. How do you find out what they want to say? Ask them. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's just, it's as simple as that. I mean, that's easy for me to say, I know. Mm -hmm. For a young writer who's just trying to get in, that's... That's, that's tough. But that's one reason it's so, so important, I think, to work through a, a reputable publisher. Because the publisher can give you the information. All of the major publishers in, in Christian music have access to all the producers. Mm -hmm. And they can find out what that producer is looking for for the artist. Or they can call up the artist and, and ask the artist what they're looking for. And they'll tell them. I mean, not, very rarely is it a secret unless it's an inside project, unless mm -hmm. they're writing it by themselves or with a couple of friends. And uh, so if you're working with a reputable publisher, uh, you can get the information. Do you think this bothers your, or does this bother your integrity as a writer, that you can't really uh, say what you want to say all the time? You're always having to work through somebody else's mind? No, I think, I think that, again, that goes back mm -hmm. to your question earlier about do a lot of the writers have that performer mm -hmm. inside of them that's, you know, crying to get out. I, I can only speak for me. I, have, I don't have a problem with that. I, I see myself as a servant, mm -hmm. as odd as that may sound. Uh, I see myself as somebody there to serve the producer and the recording artist, to try to help them to communicate with a, a wide range of people. Uh, and uh, it's a service that I do. Mm -hmm. And I don't have any statements I'm trying to make. I don't have any points I'm trying to get across, uh, at least for a general public kind of 
-hmm. you know, consumption. I, if I have something I want to say in a song, I'll say it. Mm -hmm. And if it happens that somebody wants to say that as an artist, that's great. But otherwise, it's for me or for me to play for my wife or my family or, mm -hmm. or you know, that, and that's fine. But uh, as, a, as a writer, as a professional writer, I am there to write for those artists. And so therefore, I need to be sensitive to what they're trying to say. And they're trying to communicate with a, a mass group of people. So, so I'm trying to communicate uh, uh, something Yes, but trying to mm -hmm. communicate uh, uh, for that artist so that they can get up on stage and say something that will touch people's lives. Do they generally always know what they want to say? Or a lot of times they don't know what they want to say? It depends on the artist. Mm -hmm. It really depends on the artist. Usually after they pick three or four songs for the album, they begin to get a direction on where it's going. Mm -hmm. uh, for the first two or three songs, a lot of artists don't really know for sure what they want to say in the sense of specific. They know general... Mm -hmm general themes. They know that they want to talk about obedience on this record, or they want to talk about holiness on this record, or they want to talk about discipleship on this record. Um, but after they get three or four songs, then, then the, the thing begins, the album begins to focus down. And then after they're picking the last three or four songs, yeah, very, very much so, they can, uh, uh, they can tell you what they want. Okay, Niles, thank you. This is the end of part one of the interview with uh, Niles Borup, uh, gospel music songwriter. This is Don Cusick with The Music Biz. This is Don Cusick with The Music Biz, and this is part two of the interview with Niles Borup. Niles is a uh, gospel music songwriter, wrote the Dove Award winning Via Dolorosa, uh, and has been nominated several times for uh, GMA Songwriter of the Year. Niles, let me ask you first, what does a publisher do for you? Well, publisher is there to be a partner with you, uh, mm -hmm. in theory 50-50. And uh, their job is to take your song, your job is to write the song as a writer, and then their job is to take the song, get it recorded, uh, try to get some print activity on it, uh, then collect all the money from that and pay you for what you do. So in theory, that's what they do. Mm -hmm. do but don't you get most of the cuts? 
Well, uh, it's, for me, that's a little bit of a loaded question. E, I, early on in my career, yes, mm -hmm. very much so. Uh, for the first two or three years of uh, when I was at Word, I, you know, I pounded the streets and co-wrote with a lot of people, and and uh, and yes, got a lot of my cuts. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, although now I think it's beginning to balance out a little bit more, I'm I'm learning to be able to let go of some of those things, and instead of me feeling the compulsion or the necessity to go out and pitch to an artist, I can call up the publisher and say, I just talked with, let's say, Gordon Jensen about mm -hmm. a song, and uh, and he's open to hearing it. Could you see that he gets the tape and trust that they can do that? Mm -hmm. And uh, so at that point, it becomes a mutual pitch. I, I'm finding. Uh, I'm finding it easier for me to to work with my publisher to to let them do their job and for, to free me up to do mine. But early on, yeah, while I was uh, worrying about surviving, worrying about paying uh, uh, the next uh, bill, yeah, I had a, a lot of compulsion to get out there and hustle and try to get some songs cut. Now, but you have to keep them interested in songs, don't you? I mean, you have to constantly remind them. You're probably in there, what, every day? You're calling them every day? Well, early on, when I first started writing, I think the key for me was that I was there every day. And I was the only writer who was there. They had a writer's room. It almost got to be a joke that, uh, well, we might as well not go to the writer's room because Niles is going to be there. And it was pretty much true because I found that if I were there, whenever an artist would come in or whenever an opportunity would rise to pitch, the, the first thing they would do is what's in front of them. And if I were in front of them, they'd, go, they'd think about my catalog. And uh, so being there every day was very, very important. But not just being there and in the way, being there and being active, writing. I was, I was turning out, I, I had, for the, in all of my years at Word, I've never uh, turned in less than 70 songs a year. And mm -hmm. so uh, I'm real active and co constantly writing and constantly working on material. Constantly bringing in other writers into the office, which is mm -hmm. a good thing for them. Uh, and uh, uh, kind of a high traffic person, good traffic uh, mm -hmm. person, and therefore creating a lot of attention. And that works to my favor. Uh, the writer, there are a lot of writers who say, well, I'll just write at home. And I think that's a big mistake, um, mm -hmm. at, le at least in early on in your career, I think it's a big mistake. I think it's important to, to, uh, to be there and to work real hard to try to... Do you treat it as basically a nine to five job? Yes, I do. I very much do. Uh, otherwise, I think I'd burn out. Mm -hmm. uh, all of this stuff about going around the clock because you love it so much is, is all well and good. But I've, I've already, I'm at the point now in my career, even after six years, that a lot of the people I came into to the industry with are already beginning to fade away and go into other fields. And, and the few of us that are who, who do survive are either those who became artists that became huge uh, sellers um, or uh, those of us who somehow or another uh, found a niche and found a rhythm in which we can somehow or another hang on. You say you've been a writer, a professional writer for six years. How Actually seven, but six seven. with word. How long did it take you to make a living as a writer? This last year. Mm -hmm. uh, for the first, it was so interesting because uh, the first year I was nominated for the Dove Award Songwriter of the Year, I had two songs up for Song of the Year, and a welfare recipient in California would have made more money than I did that year. So it's funny that I could have been nominated for uh, the top honor that a writer can receive in our field and yet uh, make mm. such a small amount of money. The thing though about songwriting is being able to survive, being able to last, that's the key. It's not so much who is the most talented in my opinion as much as who has the most endurance and who has the most drive and determination to hang in there because there are a lot of people who just, I just they just blow me away with their talent but they get so frustrated over a little setback mm -hmm. or if they, they're told they're going to get a cut and they didn't get a cut, uh, then they just fall all apart. I had five songs on hold for Sandy Patty's last record and didn't get one on there. You know, I had uh, three on hold for Steve Green's last record, mm -hmm. didn't get any on there. Had one on hold for Larnell Harris's record, didn't get, one on, didn't get it on there. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, it's like, that's life, that's the breaks. But, but instead, I got four on the Neelands record, and mm -hmm. I got one on Denise Williams' record. And so so you, you take it where you can get it, and you, you try to survive uh, and last until, those, until the money starts coming in. And when you say the money starts coming in, you're not just talking about great sums of money. We're mm -hmm. talking about a decent living.
Mm -hmm. And uh, and if you, I, that's all I've ever wanted. If I could ever make a decent living from writing, then I said I would just be as happy as a lark. And, how, uh, how do you make I'm a decent living from writing? Get 78 cuts in one year? 78 cuts last year, 72 the year before, uh, 34 the year before that. And so that, see, that's the last three years. The first three mm -hmm. years I was, I was at Word, um, I got 30 my first year, 31 my second. I, no, actually, I take that back. Got zero my first year, 30 my second, 31, and then 34, 72, mm -hmm. 78. And um, so every year it's, it's gone up. But that first year, the whole year I was at Word, I wrote 70 songs at Word, went in every day, and I didn't get a single cut. And I think that's very important. I spent a whole year at Acuff Rose. I wrote uh, songs there uh, day in and day out didn't get a single cut. So for two years, I received advances against future royalties and all kinds of uh, time and songs written. Didn't get a single cut. But hanging in there, believing that it would happen, mm -hmm. and, it's, and it's, it was very important. And it did pay off because in a way, I've seen so many writers come into town and they have a huge song on Amy Grant or somebody and they, they're going to make ten or $15,000. That I mean, they were going to make more money off of getting one song recorded on one album than I made from getting 30 or 40 from, you know, from a whole variety of people. And, and yet, th then they're in town for a year or two while they have that money and then all of a sudden they leave because they don't have any money. And, um, and I've seen that happen two or three times now. I've been very fortunate because mm -hmm. Uh, I mean, it may sound crazy that I wanted to go two years without cuts, but see, I had a huge catalog. So when things started popping for me, um, there were tons of songs to, to, to show people mm -hmm. in order to keep the activity going. So once I started getting activity, it's just continued to climb and it's never, it's never mm -hmm. stopped. Uh, I, I haven't gone more than three weeks without getting a cut and I've got as many as five and six major recordings in one week. Now, that happens because there are the, the songs are there in order to plug into those situations. And the songs are there because I've written a lot of material over a long time. And, and, and one way of looking at it is I had a lot of material there before the activity started so that it wasn't continually being used up. Mm -hmm. And uh, Were some of those songs that you wrote the first two years cut later? Oh, yes. As a matter of fact, uh, My Soul Desire, which Denise Williams cut this year, uh, was written, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, in my second year at Word. No, my third year at Word. But, uh, uh, still, that song sat around for two or three years. Is it pretty it normal for a song to sit around for a couple of years before it gets cut? It's not unusual at all. Mm -hmm. I have a song right now called Christians Arise on Jim Murray that we're uh, expecting very big things from that uh, was on hold for, well, for Larnell for about a year. Then for whatever reason, they didn't record it. And uh, we wrote it in, in, towards the end of 84, early 85. And so now it's 87 and... Uh, Mm -hmm. You know, finally going to be, you know, what's been recorded going to be released. Where does most of your income come? Does it come from airplay performances no. or from, from mechanicals? Or? For me, the majority of my income comes from mechanicals. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I'm, I, I'll be honest with you, I very much hope that that will change. I hope that over time it will become from print. Mm -hmm. Because print activity lasts a lot longer. A record will usually on average sell, what, two, three years. And then it'll disappear from the face of the earth. And... Uh, uh, and, and therefore your money will stop. Uh, so I'm receiving a good bit of money from mechanicals, and, but my print is very, very mm -hmm. slowly, gradually rising. Uh, but at some point I hope it will be about equal or maybe even a little bit more in print because you can count on print income mm -hmm. for a lot longer. Make, but the ASCAP, as far as gospel music goes, for me now it's becoming a nice extra source. It's, mm -hmm. uh, it's probably about one-fifth, maybe one-sixth of my income mm -hmm. comes from ASCAP. Is that because there are so few gospel stations? I believe that's probably, probably it. Have you been surprised at how few albums so many acts sell? Actually, I'm surprised by how many they do sell. Um, in country music, I'm more surprised with how many don't sell. Uh, with the exposure and the radio exposure that the artists have, uh, you would think that they would sell a lot more, but actually uh, a good moderate selling gospel artist at this point selling 50,000 is going to sell as much as a lot of the country acts. And even now our top uh, gospel artists are selling almost as much as the top country artists minus Alabama. Mm -hmm. So uh, how, how much can you make uh, getting on a top selling album? 
Well, it all depends. If, you, if you're talking about like an Amy Grant album, I wouldn't know because I haven't had an mm -hmm. Amy Grant cut, so I couldn't tell you. On a Sandy Patty, uh, especially if you have a, a big song off her album, a single off her album, you can probably expect over eight, ten years mm -hmm. after the print and the cover records and all off that song, you can probably expect forty or fifty thousand dollars. But if you think about that and you say ten years, five thousand a year, you see what I'm saying? It's, mm -hmm. it, again, it doesn't add up to that much money. It's not anything you can live off of. It's not what people think. Mm -hmm. Now, if you say fifty thousand dollars, everybody goes, "That's a lot of money." But if you think about the time that it takes in order to collect that and the fact that you're going to get little pieces of that periodically, um, you know, yeah, you get a slow mm -hmm. uh, base income for for a is, while. Is that frustrating for you? No, not at all. That's um, well, I take that back. It's, it, it is frustrating early on in your career mm -hmm. when you're trying to survive, <laughs> when you're trying to, when you get uh, your $800 royalty check in the mail and, uh, and you've been working your buns off trying to do this thing for two years. Um, yeah, it, it can be very frustrating. Now that I'm making a living at it, now that I, I'm uh, I know that next quarter my check will be such that I can live off of it. There is a little bit more relaxedness to it. There is mm -hmm. a little bit more that, well, the money is going to be there and the money is going to come. And, and uh, with the amount of material that I have out, uh, I'll, I'll make a living. Mm -hmm. so, so there's not a, that, that concern anymore. Is there much politics in uh, getting cuts in, in, in gospel? Uh, Yes, very much so. It's a, it's a tremendously political uh, uh, thing to get a cut. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot, occasionally it is a matter of who you know, and, mm -hmm. and occasionally um, uh, it's a matter of who your publisher knows or your company knows or how much power your company has or what one company can trade off for another. But I don't know that that's any different in any other field. I think the people... Uh, who have a lot of difficulty with that are the people who are are naive in the in the sense of business experience. I think in any field that you're going to go in, they're going there's politics involved. Uh, whether you work for the government, whether you work for a corporation, there's always going to be politics involved with who gets raises, what's going to be done, uh, what contracts going to be picked up, what things are going to happen. And I think the same thing is true in, in music. Mm -hmm. I think there, there are some producers who think politically and think, okay, I've got six Lorenz songs on this album and uh, Arios and Sparrow and Benson and Word are screaming bloody murder, Meadow Green screaming bloody murder, and I better try to get a couple of cuts on those people. So um, I'll try to pick the best song I can find from those people. I, again, I don't think the politics uh, are, are very rarely such that that they they cut a song knowing it's a bad song. Mm -hmm. um, I really believe that with the vast majority of artists, they want to cut what they honestly feel like for them are the best songs, meaning the songs that mm -hmm. they want to say. And uh, it may not be the best song pitched, but it's the best song of what they want to say. Mm -hmm. And uh, so they're geared more towards an album market, a con uh, conceptual market, rather than a singles market. I, I really believe overall that's true. I think, I think they they do look for singles. I don't know of any uh, artist who doesn't keep an eye out on singles or a song that would have a good title cut to it. They're always keeping an eye out on those kinds of things, those specifics. But I think always in context with. Um, Usually, a lot of times, the song that they find that will be what they think is a great single, that's what they build the album around. Mm -hmm. So they know if the, if, if the song is about discipleship, that they know that they've got a killer song there that they can really feel like they can make into a, a single and to create some attention with. Then all of a sudden, there's a tendency to seek out other songs that are in that same kind of vein, different mm -hmm. ways of saying something very similar. I don't think it's even all the time conscious. You know, they're, they're, they're just mm -hmm. always aware of that. I think that uh, a lot of times that it just may be a tendency to do that. You talk a lot about titles. Do you pay a lot of attention to titles? To have? Oh, very, very much so. Even, um, 
even more so though to concepts mm -hmm. around titles. There have been so many times when, when it's so refreshing to hear a title. I mean, well, you can always, I, the, the, always the famous example is the, the, the one the Imperials did with Praise the Lord. And it's like, who cares? You know what mm -hmm. I mean? It's like, that title certainly doesn't grab you. But the concept around that mm -hmm. idea and the way they led to that idea was so refreshing and unique when it came out that it became a monster song. Mm -hmm. And I think that, yeah, a hook is very important, but a hook isn't going to carry a song. A hook's going to grab some interest, but a hook's not going to carry a song. It's going to be the concept around the song and how well you say that concept. Uh, a song I, I listened to the other night uh, with a young man I was co-writing with, a song called Hammering Nails. And the, I, the they could have ruined that song uh, easily, but they didn't because um, the, the hook could have just fallen apart, could have not met, tied up with anything. But what they did was is they, they created a concept in which uh, Mary was uh, hearing uh, Jesus working with his father, hammering nails out on the hillside uh, when he was a little boy working with his dad. And then later on, she heard uh, the hammering nails uh, when he was mm -hmm. on the hillside on the cross. And uh, it was just like, whoa. So you see, a hook in and of itself is, is good because it'll catch your attention, but it's got to be that concept that makes you go, wow. Mm -hmm. Being nominated for, for uh, GMA Songwriter of the Year a couple times, having Via Dolorosa, has that made it easier for you to get cuts? Well, you would think so, but uh, my experience really doesn't bear, bear that out. I think that uh, it all really comes down to the song. So it's still still a song by song thing. Song by song thing. You've got to uh, you've got to continuously try to come up with a, a great song. It never stops. <laughs> Rejection. You have to learn to love it, live with it, deal with it. What? All of the, all of the above. Mm -hmm. You you pass the test. That's that's the key. It's it's not that you're. Uh, weird and are looking for somebody to beat you and whip you or anything like that. But it is a matter of being able to recognize the other person's position. There are 14 million songwriters in the U.S. 14 million songwriters. And yet in any given year there are only 14,000 who make even one penny from the industry. 14,000 people out of, that's one percent. And of that one percent, over half over 7,000 make less than $5,000 a year from writing songs. Now when, you're, when you get into that kind of thing, you're talking about only 7,000 people. I'm talking about in pop, R&B, every phase of music, classical, gospel. Mm -hmm. You're talking about less than 7,000 people who make over $5,000 a year. And what's, in, to translate that into gospel music, you're really talking about 600 or 700 people who make any money above $5,000 from writing gospel songs, or, or um, 1400 who make um, any money. Mm -hmm. Actually, no, I take that back. We're talking about seven. Gospel market is about 5% of the market. So we're talking about about 700 people who make any money in any given year from gospel music. Now, is that, is that songwriters and performers or just songwriters? Songwriters. Uh, well, actually, song, singer songwriters. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, the, the yeah, sure. Like so it's Amy not about Grant. 700 people actually making any any, any income. Any money, any any income. So you've got a publisher who are dealing, w trying to deal with 14 million to find those uh, those 14,000. Mm -hmm. So even even if odds bear them out, one out of every uh, hundred people that come into their door may work out, mm -hmm. uh, and that means may make them even a penny. And if their attitude's bad, if they, if they don't uh, have the drive and determination to warrant the investment in, in the energy that they put in, uh, it's not worth it for them to get involved. So it's almost to their credit and smartness, business smartness, to, uh, to keep a closed door. Mm -hmm. Because those writers who, who do stand out, those performers that do stand out, will somehow or another rise to the attention. They will have the drive and determination to get to know the people that they need to get to know. They will create visibility and interest. People will talk about them. And they will come to the attention of the industry. And that's more important than the raw talent. Uh, I believe probably at a certain point it is. I think, I think there's tons of people who have tremendous talent. Just tons of people who have tremendous talent. Probably out of every 15 people you meet, you probably can find two that have the talent 
to, to make it in some aspect of the music industry. But you're only going to probably find two out of a thousand or fifteen hundred that, uh, that have the talent and the drive and the determination and the other characteristics that, the, and, and maybe even this, the good luck, mm -hmm. fortune, being at the right place at the right time in order to find their place. Do you think in writing gospel music it's, it's, it's limiting? You've only got basically... Oh, no. I have found gospel music to be tremendously freeing, just the opposite. When I was at Acuff Rose, it was day in and day out writing Mo Bandy, Joe Stampley. Mm -hmm. e, then we got to stretch a little bit for Kenny Rogers or, or you know, Barbara Mandrell or something like that. But it was a, it was a very narrow area in gospel. It's been so exciting because I feel like as a writer the the world is open to me. Uh, even this year I just got a cut on Larnell Harris and got a cut on on the Mighty Clouds of Joy, a young artist named Stephen Curtis Chapman, uh, a, a song on a piano praise album, a, a, a song in a musical, uh, and that's just we're talking about just since January 1st. The the exciting thing is, is that the styles from rock music with Rick Kua all the way down to Wendy Bagwell and the Sunlighters is available to a writer if they want to take the time and interest and really try to work to understand that field and to write for that field. Okay, we had, we've had we mentioned Via Dolorosa several times and that is an example of a, of a great song. Why don't you tell me how you wrote it? How did it Where'd the idea come from? How did, how did it come about? Well, the idea came about about uh, 1983, uh, maybe even 82. Time flies. It's the I was sitting in, in front of my TV set watching the evening news on Friday night, uh, and uh, they had a picture of the Pope in Jerusalem walking the Stations of the Cross. And they said, here's the Pope on the Via Dolorosa walking the Stations of the Cross. And uh, in this uh, Via Dolorosa called the Way of Suffering, where Jesus walked, and I went, "Wow! I gotta find the pencil." So I said, "Please say that title one more time." And they said it, and they said something about Via Dolorosa. Again. So I wrote it down, and then I looked up in my Latin book what it meant, because uh, I didn't catch that the first time when they said it, and I found out it meant the Way of Suffering, and uh, I had the idea for. I guess a year and a half, two years before it was written. See, El Shaddai had just been, been a big song. I know that another big song, uh, well, actually, I don't know if it was ever a single, but it was another big song as far as a lot of cuts. Um, uh, oh, my mind just went blank on the title of it. But anyway, there were several songs mm -hmm. with the Hebrew or, or some kind of uh, well, foreign name. Yeshua. Yeshua was a, well, that was afterwards. But um, the, the thing that happened was, is I went to a lot of co-writers and they went, nah, nah, that's, you know, every, everybody's tired of those titles. So I said, okay. Um, and then I got together one day with Billy Sprague and I said, well, I, I want to be honest with you, Billy, there's been a lot of people who uh, have had, you know, the opportunity to write this idea, but they weren't interested. But, you know, maybe you might be, because I really like it. Mm -hmm. And I said it to him, he just about fell out of his chair. He loved it. He just went, oh, no, nice. I love that idea. Let's write it. So, uh, we wrote it in about two, two and a half hours together. Mm. And it was a really, it was, it was just, it flowed. It was one mm. of those kind of times. Did you have any idea of a melody on that to start with, or? No, we just worked from the hook. Um, mm -hmm. Billy, I really, uh, Billy really needs to be given credit uh, for having a real major part in that melody. I mean, I, 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 can't, I made mm -hmm. a significant contribution, but, uh, but he really, he was playing the instrument and mm -hmm. he kind of, he's the one who decided to come up with that Spanish kind of mm -hmm. feel and the, and the direction we went with it. How'd you get it to Sandy Patty? Well, it's real interesting. Uh, the day we got it finished, we ran out the door, played it for my publisher, he got all excited, then we ran down and played it for Randy Cox, which at that point was Billy Sprague's publisher. He got all excited about it. They got on the phone right away, called Greg Nelson, brought him over, sat him down, played it for him. Greg said, I'll put that on hold for Sandy, even though she's not going to be cutting for two years. And we said, okay, well, that's fine with us. And for two years, it was on hold for Sandy Patty. Mm -hmm. And there was about five or six times when it almost didn't get cut. Yeah. Did, do you know what her reaction was first time she, she heard it? Or? Well, I've heard what she said now that it's a success. I don't know what it was uh, uh -huh. when she first, uh, I mean, it may have been what she said. Mm -hmm. I don't really know. Uh, the... Um, I mean, it was obvious that there was some type of positive response because they did put it on hold mm -hmm. and they did keep it on hold. And 
what happened was is there was another song uh, in the meantime that somebody wrote, I'm not even sure who, and they, theirs was called Via Dolorosa too. Mm. And uh, it was cut by Dennis Agajanian, and they put it on the front cover of Music Line magazine, Via Dolorosa by Dennis Agajanian, his new single. And we got a call that said, well, if that song charts, we're not cutting Via Dolorosa. Well, our hearts dropped because we'd already mm -hmm. had it on hold for a year and a half. And uh, uh, I, I've never wished bad on anybody. And I, if it had charted, that had been fate. But uh, I'm kind of glad it didn't chart. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, well, thank you, Niles, for, uh, for being here. Uh, this is Niles Borup, uh, gospel songwriter, uh, writer of Via Dolorosa. And uh, this is the end of part two of this interview. This is Don Cusick with The Music Biz. Thank mm -hmm. you.